Welcome to Conversations. I'm Mukhtar Darkhan, your host. And as you can see, this is one of my first in-studio conversations. Welcome to the studio, Professor Thank Velia you. Thank Guar. You uh, Professor Velia Guar is from Costa Rica. She teaches international trade, international finance. She teaches economic issues. She is also a very prominent columnist who writes a weekly column in the media in Costa Rica. She has also served as the Vice Minister of Economics and Finance in Costa Rica. And she is also, she's very familiar with her development aid, and not just in Costa Rica, but also in Central Asia. But she also spent five months in China most recently, and that has really intrigued uh, my interest. And I hope she will be able to share with us some interesting insights uh, about her visit uh, to China. But before I tell you more about uh, Velia Gowar and her experiences in China, uh, I want you to do the needful, that is subscribe to Conversations, ring the bell icon. I'm sure you're going to like this video, so plan to share it with your friends and with your network. So welcome to Conversations, Professor. Thank you very much, Professor Khan. So, so I'm going to begin by first asking <laughs> Velia about her trip to China. So how was your visit to China and why did you go there? Um, well, I have always written a lot in the press about the U.S. foreign policy, but also about uh, China's public policies. And I think that was the main reason why the Embassy of China in Costa Rica picked me up and offered me this uh, possibility to take a course in China, five months course uh, to learn more about uh, their culture, their history, and also their public policies. So did you study the domestic and foreign policy? More the domestic than the foreign policies. So did this, did this five months, obviously you have now far more knowledge about China than you did. Did it change in some way what you thought about China before you went and now? Um, it's not the same to read about a public policy and how's the impact of it, that to be present, uh, go to a little village to see how the alleviation of poverty policies work out in that specific uh, town, like the town of Naju that I visit in the province of Shanxi, <laughs> that I never care to pronounce well. Uh, and to see how it works, uh, it's a completely different output. And I didn't know a lot about Chinese culture, or I have never been to China before. Then being in Beijing for four months, being in Shanghai, going to the province of Shanxi or the province of Fujian gave me a whole new perspective about China. So how, how many people were there in your group? And from how many well, countries? We were like 90 People. 90 people <laughs> yes. for five months. For five months all over the world. We were 18 from Latin America. Oh, wow. So, so, so they probably divided into five continents with 18 each. Exactly. We had our lessons in Spanish by the Beijing University of Foreign Studies. I don't understand this number 18. If you notice, all our SUSI cohorts are also 18. <laughs> yeah, 18 only Latin America. Oh, that, that's a massive uh, investment in public diplomacy. Yes. Uh, so you must have also made lots of connections with other people from foreign ones, or everybody else who is part of the cohort of this program. Yes, I made a lot of friends. It was very interesting to see how I could speak French with the Algerian colleague or with the Cameroon colleague from Africa or uh, English with the Guyanese colleagues that are from Latin America, but they do not speak Spanish. So now, as, as you realize that the tensions between the US and China are slowly growing, and there's a lot of competition between US and China, especially in Africa mm -hmm. and Latin America. And now there's a lot of uh, the Western media is getting the memo to demonize China. So now we are constantly, you know, I mean, the Fox News will always refer to it as, as a communist China. They will never say China. But uh, even the mainstream liberal media is also beginning to provide a more negative, uh, they're focusing on the negative aspects of China. So when you went there, did, did you feel that you were in a very authoritarian country? Like, what was your experience? Like, how do you, you've been now at the US several times, you've been in China. How did you feel? 
I feel in the US at home and I felt in China at home. It was very strange. I didn't feel any authoritarian. Well, they have a, a little bit of, let's say, a personal cult that's very clear. About but Xi Jinping. yes, but of course, when you see the 10 years um, progress that have made in these 10 years, you can understand why they're um, so excited about it. Um, but they focus more on the people. I think that's important. You want to understand the people and you see that people are people all over the world. It doesn't change if it's Korea, China or the US or even Latin America. So, of course, we know the official uh, narrative of the Chinese yes. government. But when you talk to people, uh, the people who you interacted with, what do they think are the great achievements of Xi Jinping in China in the past few years? Let's say it this way. I went a lot in the mornings to the park and I saw all these elderly people running and doing Tai Chi and doing different activities. And they look well fed, they look happy, uh, they look peaceful. And for me, how you care about old people, it's very important. If you feel that their elderly are well, that means you are doing something fine. And you were there during the zero COVID. I was there. I had to do a 10 days quarantine in a hotel, site 34 quarantine in Shanghai. That was a little bit uh, of a, a struggle because, you know, I have never done quarantine before in my life. And then I did uh, four months of doing my COVID test each 48 hours. But you get used to it. And you feel safe because everybody that you know around has done the same, then at that moment it was, I think, a good policy. But of course, the big question was what's going to happen when they will open up. And they did after I left. I didn't have the impact to see, you know, COVID rising in Beijing as it did in December. I was already in my country. Uh, but it was a very tough decision how to do it, gradually or not. And they care a lot about their elders and they respect them a lot. I don't think they didn't really want to press them to, to be vaccinated. And it, it's understandable. It's part of their culture. But on the other hand, is the most vulnerable population. Then it was kind of a, a struggle how to balance the opening with uh, three years of closing all the frontiers. Did you see signs of poverty? Did you see signs of uh, as a, or unemployment or people unhappy as a result of the close? Because one of the biggest consequences of the closing has been the decline uh, uh, in the growth of the Chinese economy. Isn't yeah. It? I didn't see like people in the streets, even elderly people will do something. I will, you know, I'll, even manual works then I had the impression there was not idle people around there. Uh, on the other hand, I I was there five months, and sometimes when we talk with people, they will complain loudly about everything, even the government. <laughs> and I will think, okay, sounds like home. In Costa Rica, we do that all the time. We complain, and we complain, and we complain, and we, we live in a very nice country, in fact. You know, Costa Rica is a small island country <laughs> living <laughs> under the shadow of the United States for a century, I guess a couple of hundred years of at least hundred years of US domination. So how do you feel about China's growing interest in Costa Rica? Are you going to be switching hegemons I and mean, go from US domination to Chinese domination? Let's, let's say that Costa Rica do not feel dominated ever by the yeah. US. Okay. <laughs> Let's start at that point. I think the country has had a very stable uh, history, very stable, very democratic. We are the second democracy in the continent yeah. after the US. Then we, of course, feel a lot of American influence, maybe because we have a lot of foreign direct investment and we have a lot of writers, retirement people that come to yeah. Costa Rica and live. But the relation has been always very friendly. Then we don't, we feel very Latin American, very Costa Rican, and we feel the influence of the US, but not the dominance. And it's the same with China. We had a lot of Chinese, uh, how you say, descendants of the country. 
uh, our oh, only... you have a lot of Chinese. Yeah, we have a lot of Chinese descendants, and they have very well integrated in our culture. And the only astronaut that Costa Rica has and went to the NASA and to the moon a couple of times is from Chinese descendant. So where did these their forefathers? When did their forefathers come, and how did they come to Costa Rica? To work, like any immigrant. We have so you had Chinese immigrants coming to Costa Rica. Yes, from a long time. When you say a long time, yes, we are talking about one or two centuries ago, almost since the beginning of the. Like they came to the U.S. Like they came to the U.S., they came to Costa Rica, and they just mingled with the okay. population, and uh, of course, I think they came from Fujian province mainly. Uh, then it's a different, uh, how you say, physiognomy that the one I saw in Beijing. They were very handsome in Beijing, I have to tell you. <laughs> I, know, I never expected that. That maybe was the only surprise that I really had. I was very open-minded when I went, but um, I had two surprises. First, I loved the food, but okay. I wasn't uh, expecting that that much. And then the people are very well-dressed and they look very cosmopolitan in Beijing. The Chinese, they have... Uh, the, the, where you see more the middle class in how they behave and how they dress and the people are very sometimes even very very handsome and very beautiful the women did you have any conversations about the u.s and how do they view in like how did <laughs> i mean we know how, how china talks about the u.s to us but how did they talk about the u.s to you no i didn't no not much. no they were so interested about my country and uh I had a lot of interaction with the professors in Spanish. Then we talk about Latin America mainly. That was the main point for them. They're very interested in the region. Of course they are. I mean, yes. I, I remember <laughs> the, the, their investments now, I think, uh, have outstripped U.S. investments and trade yes. in Latin America. They are a major economic force in China. Exactly. So, and, and it is not... A, I mean, just as the U.S. has an Indo-Pacific strategy and the U.S. is being so aggressive both economically and geopolitically in the Chinese backyard. I think China wants to return the favor by, mm -hmm. <laughs> by basically penetrating the boundaries of the Monroe Doctrine, right? And they're yes. doing it via, via trade, basically. Exactly, because they are the main trading partner of Brazil, for example, yeah. Uruguay, that is a little country like Costa Rica, uh, Argentina also, they have uh, Chile also. Then it's South America mainly. Uh, Central America, the presence is lower, but it's growing. And uh, we were talking before that uh, China was, in a period of time, the second uh, largest partner in Costa Rica for trade. But it was Intel Costa Rica. It was a U.S. company, company yeah. that is was radicated in Costa Rica and is now that was exporting computers to China. It was not Costa Rican exports at the end. It were a mixture. So you have been part of the government. You even were a vice minister. And so you have connections uh, in Costa Rican government. Has the Costa Rican government reached out to you to ask them, did they call you and say, can you brief us on your visit to China? what your recommendations are? Not yet, not yet, but I, I, I think they will at some point. Yes. So, so is there, I mean, is this, this is clearly a big investment, right, for China to bring in scholars for five months. And uh, I have a pretty good idea of how much it would cost because we run a similar program <laughs> at a smaller scale. Uh, we, I mean, the SUSI is roughly the same size as mm -hmm. this program with other SUSIs that we have. So, so clearly this is a, a, an important effort to influence the influencers, right? That is the goal, to influence the influencers. So, like, do you have any idea, like, what... Like, suppose your government says, so what are the three or four important things about China that Costa Rican government should keep in mind? Yes, I will say cooperation for mitigation of uh, disasters, uh, cooperation for climate change, and uh, the what? Belt and Road Initiative also. We haven't been very active. We have already signed it in 2017, but we've, we haven't been active in it. Then I think uh, we have a lot to explore there. What do you mean by active? Like, do you expect Costa Rica to take 
initiatives with the BRI or China? For example, with Panama. Panama is a very good training partner of Costa Rica and it's our southern southern neighbor. Yeah. And they are being very active with China and we could link with that effort, for example. With the, are you talking yes. about the canal? We are talking about the canal because we don't have a trade route that is direct to China and we will benefit a lot if we have a... The road connecting to the canal. Yes. So you basically want a highway that goes to... <laughs> <laughs> where you can that would be very nice or a railroad that goes through the whole Central America that you can send your bananas to China we can send more bananas to China if we, we send them to the US and to the European Union but now we could send more to China how is this? I mean for those of you who are not familiar there is already the Panama Canal but China is trying to build a canal uh, you know from, from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean uh -huh which is going to be, they say, five times bigger than the Pan uh, Panama Canal. It will be deeper. And of course, it will be more or less Chinese canal. So it will help Chinese trade, etc. How far so. along is that project? Is are they? I'm not very sure. It's more in the hands of the Panamanian government, but they are working on it. And sincerely, from Costa Rican perspective, they are being much more dynamic in the relationship with China than Costa Rica. And then I think we have a very good margin to improve our relation. Why are you, why are you shy? Like, is, is it like it's, you haven't taken the initiative or is it is it your friendly relation with the U.S. <laughs> which <laughs> makes no, you hesitate? Costa, Costa Rica is very proud to be neutral, you know, yeah, to, yeah. To, to don't feel the pressure of one country or the other. Because I think we have deserved the right to choose. We have a, a stable experiment on democracy. Yeah. We haven't been, we have never had a squeamish or any kind of problem with the US, but we, we, we feel we are, we're very autonomous. We know we depend economically on trade and investment with the US, but it's a quite friendly relationship. Uh, of course, sometimes we feel the pressure, let's say, but um, in the region, Costa Rica was the first one to open diplomatic ties with China. Well, I'm talking about Central America and the Caribbean. That was the first country and the first to establish a free trade agreement. I think it has more to do about domestic issues. Um, I, I don't know, it has been a little bit of lack of interest, maybe, of recent administrations, but it's more domestic related than foreign <laughs> affairs related. I don't think it has to be with the US because we had two administrations in power that were more from the left side than the right side. Do you, you think that it will go further to China than the US? But no, we always maintain our relation very stable with the US. And there was a dissent or decrease of our interest, but I don't exactly know why. Is, is off the record, U.S. diplomats, uh, U.S. leaders who visit Costa Rica, do they kind of express uh, some kind of saying, oh, you know, you can trade with China, but, you know, we're not going to like that. Yeah. <laughs> they do. They, they yeah. put pressures. I, I, can, I am not going to say who did that recently, but somebody did that. So, so there is a pressure from the U.S. Yes. not to... But Especially with the Belt and Road Initiative, yeah, right? But Costa Rica feels that it will do whatever is convenient for Costa Rica. Costa, Costa Rica <laughs> is uh, on the democracy index rated higher than the US. Yeah. <laughs> we are more democratic. So instead of US hosting the democracy forum, I think Costa Rica or Uruguay should have <laughs> hosted it. They are better democracies, at least yeah. on, on, in terms of indicators than the US. You also don't have an army, right? You don't no, have... it was abolished 75 years ago, more or less. So you, how does that work? Uh, like you... That's a very good question. <laughs> it has worked very well in the last seven decades because for some reason we have been left alone by our neighbor in the north. We are talking about the problems yeah. of the rest of Central America. And um, the country made a conscious decision to abolish the army, but it has always had a, a stable, how you say, uh, governance. And it has worked well. We invested money in education and it pay off later on our development. So is, uh, is your education budget bigger than your defense budget? 
we don't have defense budget oh wow. to answer your question no, but you, i mean you, <laughs> so what happens like if if you suddenly get a, a lot of immigrants from from region because your country is doing well financially politically stable it should be a magnet for regional um, we are we are especially a magnet for nicaraguan immigrants and we have a very large fr uh, frontier that we cannot keep uh, that that is very difficult to, to to manage because it's half a river half forest or jungle let's say that then uh, we receive a lot of illegal immigrants from nicaragua and you can't stop or do anything we do all the best we can but it's kind of impossible to 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 it's a really large frontier for us we have the police force we enforce as much as we can and sometimes from time to time we have amnesties and we just receive the people we do the best we can and we are trying to be as solidary as possible with them but it's difficult you know a couple of weeks ago india hosted a conference called uh, the voice of the global south and mm -hmm. uh, india is going to be the president uh, mm -hmm. has a presidency of g20 this year and one of the criticism of g20 is that it's a bit elitist it, it excludes most of the world only 19 economies and eu are part of g20 so india in order to kind of assert its global leadership and distinguish itself from other global powers is saying that we will speak for the global south which is excluded from deliberations in g20 and so they hosted this conference uh, and about 120 countries participate participated and i failed to check uh, for some reason the the list of those 120 countries was not available on the web i couldn't find if costa rica was part of it or not but broadly speaking how how do people in costa rica and central america see india as is do they see it as a rising power do they see it as a potential voice uh, say in g20 and un security council for countries like costa rica Oh, I have to tell you, I don't think India has done much on our, uh, how you say, scenery between the influence of the U.S., the, the um, worries about Nicaragua that are always present. And I'm speaking as a, yeah, as a, a personal, you know, yeah, as so a personal mother. Yeah. And then uh, the rising influence of China. But, but you know, a, India is very far away from us and we don't think about India that much. You know, I find that very surprising because in your neighborhood, there is a lot of presence of uh, the Indian diaspora, especially in the Caribbeans, right? A, yes. a lot of Indians even are heads of states there. Yeah. And India is, is interacting a lot in the Caribbean, in Guyana and Trinidad. And Trinidad. But it doesn't happen in Costa Rica. The diaspora, of, the Indian diaspora in Costa Rica is almost... It's very, it's, it's very little. I was going to say non-existent, but I'm not very sure about that. But it, it should be very, very little. The Chinese diaspora is big. The German, the Italian. Of okay. course, we are Spanish descendant. But the Indian diaspora is very little. We don't... So it's like a blind spot. In it's the... a blind spot for us. Huh, that is interesting. I think it's a matter of capacity, right? I, I think that even though the Indian government is does not say it explicitly, but first of all, the current administration is doing a lot more than the previous administration to reach out mm -hmm. to countries in the global south. But I think they are prioritizing those countries which have a larger diaspora than not. Yes. Yes. So looking forward, I mean, I, I want to ask change a little bit from what we've been talking, uh, you are you write a lot about international trade and you write a lot about um, economic conditions uh, in other parts of the world besides Costa Rica. So one of the consequences of COVID and, and the Russian war uh, in Ukraine is the disruptions of supply chains and mm -hmm. this whole idea that perhaps globalization as we knew it is coming to an end. Uh, what is your view about this? Is globalization coming to an end? And are we going to see a new way or new arrangement of the global economy? Some people say it's globalization. Somebody, some people are talking about offshoring being replaced with French shoring. So how do you see, what do you think is happening to the global economy if globalization kind of, you know, 
uh, fritters away? I think globalization is not going to fritter away immediately. I think it's going to last more time. But yes, the world is more divided politically. Uh, what happened with the supply chain uh, disruption was a really, uh, how you say, important message. Uh, Costa Rica is very focusing now in uh, near shoring or French shoring. Yeah. And in fact, there has been a movement between the US, Costa Rica, and Dominican Republic, like a triangle. Dominican Republic for the Caribbeans, Costa Rica for Central America, and the US. Uh, because uh, uh, we are nearby, we have more or less the same schedule on the same time level. Uh, we are big in services also. And I have to confess, Costa Rica sees this moment like an opportunity. And we know it's a threat for the world, but for Costa Rica, it's a moment where we can establish more and um, more tight with the US, even more than the ones we have. So basically, this nearshoring will be a huge advantage to the US over China, right? At least for, in Central America and Latin yes, America. Yes, and especially Costa Rica. Oh, that's that, because we have the basis. We have already two hundred companies from the U.S. We are big in services. We are big in uh, medical devices, in electronic components, and other uh, investments. Um, the country has proved to be a very good ally, ally in the sense of trade partner. Uh, the country is stable. The country has good governance, and. I think we're going to get more and more nearby the US, more than we are already in this moment. One of the things that you said you would recommend to your country or your government is uh, cooperation on uh, on environmental issues. Yes. So, so everybody is facing some kind of a consequence of the change in the climate and, and so on. So given this, like which which part of the world do you see as a potential partner in facing climate change? I think there are two. Um, Costa Rica has been very good uh, in uh, environmental policies. You know that we reversed the deforestation we had in the 60s. And in the 80s, we have the second uh, largest uh, place in uh, reforestation. Okay. We did a wonderful job and we have been well recognized because of it. And Costa Rica has 6% of the world biodiversity in a very stretch and narrow uh, you know, yeah. piece of land. Uh, I think it's good to ask for cooperation of the US and of China too. That's interesting. I will ask for both of them the possibility to make sure that Costa Rica remain the heaven, the heaven that it is now for the world and the planet. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Velia Guar, for talking to us and uh, enlightening us about not just the the kind of uh, competition in public diplomacy <laughs> between the U.S. and China. Uh, what, but what is interesting is you have benefited from both the programs. So yes. in many ways, I think that the competition between <laughs> these two powers may be is beneficial to, largely for the global south, yeah. uh, wherever they are competing. Uh, and thank you very much for being thank on the conversation. Thank you very much, Professor Khan. Thank you. For those of you who have enjoyed these conversations, I'd, I need to remind you again, please subscribe to Conversations, uh, uh, ring the bell icon, like the video, share it with your friends. Mm -hmm.